I mean, I remember it like it was yesterday. We're sitting there. We're on our knee after practice on Thursday. And Coach Blard is looking around, and he's talking to us. And he goes, I tell you what, fellas. If y'all win Saturday, y'all won't have to report back to campus until Tuesday. And I looked, I looked at Ken, Ken Hall was in the center, and he was sitting right next to him. And I said, damn, Ken, I think we're going to beat these guys, man. I mean, that was just, it was, everything was kind of flowing into place. Everything just kind of happened. Nobody missed practice that week, you know. I mean, it was it, it was a great week for everybody to kind of say, golly, the number one team in the you know, country, we're only here, got to play them again. It was happened for 22 straight years. We've got our ass handed to us, you know, 22 straight years. Oh, man, no reason to think anything's going to be different. But everything that week, just, I mean, everything was clicking. Everything was just clicking. And then when he said that on Thursday, you know, he said, he said that we could have all till Tuesday if we win. I was, man, I, I said, I think that's it, man. We're going we're gonna to beat these guys. Welcome to Hidden Yardage. I'm your host, Joe Moore. This podcast is a journey back to the 1980 college football season through the memories of those that played, coached, and covered it. New episodes, released each week, will carry listeners through that season one week at a time. For more information, please visit the website at www.hiddenyardagepodcast.com. If this is your first time listening, you may want to go back and start with Episode 1. This is Episode 9. Bear Down. On Halloween night in 1980, trick-or-treaters dressed as goblins and devils roamed the streets of Jackson, Mississippi. But the most frightening thing in the state capitol that evening was hibernating in a downtown hotel. Bear Bryant and his number one ranked Alabama Crimson Tide, winners of 28 straight college football games, had made the 200-mile trip from campus to take on the Mississippi State Bulldogs at Mississippi Memorial Stadium. The night before the game, President Jimmy Carter was in front of the governor's mansion, making an 11th-hour plea to Southern voters ahead of next week's election day. But the landslide that awaited the president on Tuesday was nothing compared to what Bulldog fans had been dealing with for decades. Mississippi State beat Alabama in 1957, the year before Mama called and Bear Bryant returned to Tuscaloosa. Since then, the tide had rolled to 22 straight victories over the Bulldogs. In the 10 meetings between the teams during the last decade, the average score was 36-9, to and only once had Mississippi State come closer than 17 points. The dominance of the Bear over the Bulldogs stretched back even further. The team from Starkville had beaten a Bryant coach team just once in 26 tries, in 1952, when he was still prowling the sidelines for the Kentucky Wildcats. For Clarion Ledger beat reporter Rick Cleveland, there was little doubt as to the outcome of Saturday's game, as he and his fellow writers gathered on Friday night. The story illustrated how big it was. We had we had so many national media in town that at the newspaper I worked with at the time, we had a big party on Friday night before the game that a lot of the national media attended. And then we were having so much fun, we went out to the reservoir uh, in Madison County, actually, a few miles from Jackson, um, when the bars closed in Jackson, we went out there and we stayed till like 4 or 5 a.m. This was one of those early afternoon kickoffs. But man, the, the, uh, the over and under on aspirin and coffee that morning in the press box was, was astronomical. Uh, there were a lot of people hurt. But, you know, at the same time, we figured that it wasn't going to be uh, like climbing a mountain, it's going to be a pretty easy assignment. You know, state would stay close for a half, three quarters, and then Alabama's depth would take over and they'd win by two or three touchdowns. I mean, we've done that story a bunch of times before. If another chapter in the same old story was what the media and fans were expecting that Saturday in Jackson, 
What they got was something completely different. What they got was one of the greatest upsets in college football history. And it was all thanks to a tough, pipe-smoking Texan that gave Mississippi State a secret weapon. In the late 1920s, in a small town known as the watermelon capital of Texas, an oil man and his wife were expecting a son. The man had some dealings with the banker, who, being a lifelong bachelor, had no children of his own. He offered the expecting mother a deal. If she were to name her son after him, he would put a fund in the bank for the baby boy. She agreed, and that's how Emery Ballard got his name. Shortly after he was born, the banks went bust. There would be no fund waiting for him, but Emery would stake claim to his own fortune as a football coach, and in the process, create one of the most devastating offensive innovations in American football history. Head coach Daryl Royal had established the University of Texas as one of the most powerful programs in the country, winning the school's first national title in 1963. But by the mid-60s, the losses were piling up for the Longhorns, and Royal needed to make a change. He found Ballard coaching at a Texas high school and brought him to Austin to lead his defense. After the 1967 season ended with another disappointing 6-4 record, Ballard was given control of the offense. Texas averaged just 18 points a game, but had a bevy of talented running backs on its roster. Ballard decided to install a triple option offense that summer, but it was a slight change that he made to a well-known formation that would forever change the game. Here's how he described it in his autobiography. Quote, I took the old straight T formation and moved the fullback closer to the quarterback, right behind him. The halfbacks were moved a step deeper and closer together, lining up five yards behind the offensive guards instead of behind the tackles. The two halfbacks were just two yards apart. End quote. When Texas opened the 1968 season, Bill Bradley was the quarterback, and Ballard's newly invented offense sputtered out of the gates. The first game ended in a tie with Houston, the second a loss to Texas Tech. But in that game, the struggling Bradley was replaced by James Street, and the next week, Texas blasted Oklahoma State 31-3. Later that evening, as coaches and media gathered in Suite 2001 of the Villa Capri Hotel in Austin, everybody was wondering what to call this peculiar new-fangled offense that Ballard had conjured. A columnist from Houston suggested that the shape of the formation reminded him of a wishbone. The name stuck, and for the second time in his life, Emery Ballard was about to make somebody else's name famous. The wishbone would prove unstoppable. Texas would win its next 30 games in a row and claim back-to-back national championships before finally falling to Notre Dame in the 1971 Cotton Bowl. Every coach in America wanted to speak with Royal and Ballard and learn the secrets of their offense. The philosophy spread, and soon the wishbone's eight yards in a cloud of astroturf was being seen all across the game. In the spring of 1971, after a pair of six win seasons, Bear Bryant invited Ballard to campus for a coaching clinic. Afterwards, Bryant and his staff spent hours in Ballard's motel room as he diagrammed his wishbone offense on a chalkboard. In August, Bryant summoned Ballard to Tuscaloosa once again, this time to provide a crash course for his coaches as they made their final preparations for the season. The offense did for Alabama what it did for Texas, helping the Bear to a national title in 1973 and again in 78 and 79. Ballard moved on from the University of Texas after the 71 season to take over as head man at Texas A&M. After turning the Aggies into winners, he resigned and was hired as head coach at Mississippi State for the 1979 season. His first year was a struggle, as the Bulldogs lost their last five games and limped to a 3-8 and record. But more than any of his three victories on the field that year, his biggest win may have come on the recruiting trail, when he beat both Vince Dooley and Bear Bryant for the commitment of a brash young quarterback, perfectly suited to run his wishbone offense named John Bond. Kermit Davis, who is now the head basketball coach at Ole Miss, and I and his brother Bill grew up together in Starville. My dad was, um, he became dean of men in like the year that I was born. And so he was, you know, an employee of Mississippi State and worked there for several years till he got the dean of students job at Valdosta State. So that's why we moved. So I came back, and I never played football until I got to Valdosta. I didn't like football. I don't like basketball because my next door neighbor was the head basketball coach at Mississippi State. So that was Kermit Sr. And uh, so I came back every year uh, to basketball camps. 
And uh, I think, and I, I tell this, and, and uh, I think if it didn't matter who was going to be the head coach there. I love Coach Lawrence, but it didn't really matter who was going to be the head coach at Michigan State. I was going to be there. Um, I just, you know, I mean, that was just in my in my blood. I was born in Starville and grew up in Starville and, and uh, absolutely loved it. Mississippi State opened the 1980 campaign with a road win against Memphis State. Bond was brought into the game during the second half and played well enough to win the starting job for the rest of the season. The Bulldogs won three of their next four games and were streaking at 4-1 and one when they were embarrassed at home by Southern Miss, 42-14. to 14. The shocking loss came at a critical juncture, as the back half of the schedule was loaded with tests against ranked teams and rivals. Not willing to let the promising season slip away, some seniors decided to take a stand. So we had a team meeting, and we came out of that team meeting that Sunday night and said that uh, the reporters were outside. I said, what y'all, what y'all talk about? Only team meeting. Uh, we said, we're going to win the rest of our games. They said, but what about Alabama? We said, we're going to win the rest of our games. <laughs> and uh, that's how we kept it. It was a Sunday. We're watching the Southern film, and they really got pissed. Uh, the seniors, the older guys like Tyrone and you know, those guys and, and uh, even Johnny Cooks, you know, Johnny Cooks was uh, on that team. And uh, they uh, they wanted a players-only meeting. And what it, it first started out, they, they said, we want a seniors-only meeting. So I said, whew, I'm glad I get to leave. <laughs> and so, so I started walking out, and Johnny Cooks grabbed me and pulled me back, not you, Bond. <laughs> so I had to go back in. And that was when they strapped it on, man. They said, that's Hey, we're not going to lose another game. We're fixing to uh, we're fixing to get serious and get after it, and and we've got the pieces here. And and uh, yeah, I remember very distinctly because I thought I was going to get out of that meeting, and no such luck. <laughs> While unbeaten Alabama kept rolling at number one, Mississippi State got back on track with wins over Miami and Auburn to generate some momentum heading into the matchup with the Tide. In practice the week before the game, Coach Villard said of Alabama's punishing ground attack. I invented the wishbone, and I can stop it. For the first time since coming to Starkville, he spent the whole week of practice coaching the defense. The week of preparation had the Bulldogs believing they could win, despite the fact that this home game was actually being played two hours away from campus in Jackson. For decades, the stadium in Jackson played host to many of the biggest games for both Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Well, at that time, the uh, stadiums in Oxford and Starkville both seated probably in the low to mid thirties, the home stadiums were not anything special. Both state and Ole Miss played most of their big home football games in Jackson. In fact, they played double headers in Jackson a lot. Uh, Ole Miss would play an afternoon game, and State would play the night game. So Jackson hosted a lot of big games back then. Mississippi State was a 16-point underdog at kickoff before the largest crowd to ever watch a football game in the state of Mississippi. Alabama threatened to score first after recovering a Bulldogs fumble at midfield in the opening quarter. Tied quarterback Don Jacobs led his team to the Mississippi State 23-yard line before fumbling the ball back to the home team on an errant pitch attempt. Freshman quarterback John Bond led a scoring threat of his own early in the second quarter, but his would-be touchdown pass, one of just 10 throws he attempted in the game, was intercepted in the end zone. As time was running out in the first half, Alabama punted in a still scoreless game. As the Bulldogs' Mardi McDowell signaled for a fair catch, the ball started to drift to his left. He made a diving attempt to field it, but the ball ricocheted off his hands and was recovered by Alabama. Three plays gained just three yards, and kicker Pete Kim booted a 49-yard field goal as time expired to give the Tide a 3-0 lead at the break. It was a ferocious first half of hitting, dominated by both defenses. It appeared all the hard work that Ballard and the Bulldogs had done during the week was paying off, as middle linebacker Johnny Cooks led a stonewalling of Alabama's option attack. Stopping the number one team for a half was one thing. Maintaining that advantage against the supremely talented Tide and its legendary coach was another. Mississippi State and its freshman quarterback would have to overcome not just a three-point deficit in the second half, but the ghosts of the last 22 years as well. As Mississippi State tried to reverse history in Jackson, a battle for the ages was about to be waged between the Hedges and Athens, Georgia. The game's two greatest runners, South Carolina's George Rogers and Georgia's Herschel Walker, led their teams in a late-season showdown with the Heisman Trophy and the Bulldogs' perfect season on the line. 
Rogers and his teammates were looking to go where no Gamecocks had gone before. Never had a South Carolina team been ranked in the top 10, and never had it defeated a team ranked in the top 10. Now, the once-beaten and 14th-ranked Gamecocks had a chance to do both against the number 4 Georgia Bulldogs. It was the greatest South Carolina team of all time, and Rogers' exceptional talent was unquestioned. He was the country's leading rusher, having already surpassed 1,000 yards for the third season in a row in just 19 quarters of football. But would Heisman voters give the trophy to a great player that they could never see? In his four years at South Carolina, the senior running back had never once appeared on national television. During the week before this game, ABC got 136 letters and cards requesting that the network show the South Carolina-Georgia game. One, the New York Times reported, was written in crayon and said simply, Put George on. The fans got their wish, and now everybody from coast to coast could see this duel between Rogers and Walker. One of those fans that would be watching from the stands was Rogers' father. Absent for much of his son's life, George Sr. was paroled from prison in October after serving nearly eight years. The TV networks wanted to set up a press conference between father and son, but George Jr., never eager to speak with reporters, dismissed that request. He would instead use the team's off week to heal his broken hand and prepare for the junkyard dog defense. Rogers' counterpart, Herschel Walker, had a different attitude towards his widespread stardom. He loved it. He was said to never turn down an interview or an autograph, and at just 18 years old, was easily the most recognizable person on campus, always seen on his way to class. He was an award-winning disco dancer, but claimed to have no time for partying or dating women. He was a terror on the football field, hard-working and humble in the classroom, and had some believing that he could make history as the first-ever freshman to win the Heisman Trophy. Through the first seven games of his career, he was the seventh-leading rusher in the country, averaging nearly six yards a carry and scoring nine touchdowns, his production nearly identical to Rodgers. To preserve their unbeaten season, the Bulldogs would ride their star running back, and the Gamecocks, as they had done all year, would go as far as Big George could carry them. The matchup between Walker and Rogers was billed as a heavyweight title fight, but both backs would sacrifice victory in that individual battle if it meant their team could win the war. Georgia had enjoyed 10 straight victories in the series between the two programs before South Carolina won back-to-back games in 78 and 79. This year's meeting was the most anticipated and important since the teams started playing each other in 1894. More than 62,000 fans packed Sanford Stadium along with nine Bowl Scouts on a cloudless day in Athens. South Carolina got the ball first, and surprising nobody, gave the ball to number 38. When Georgia had it, it was a steady dose of number 34. And after one quarter, Rodgers had 11 carries, and Walker had 13, with the Bulldogs leading 3-0. As the first half came to a close, Georgia threatened once again, with a first and goal at the South Carolina four-yard line. Three straight runs by Herschel left the ball one yard from the goal line and created a decision for head coach Vince Dooley. Having already missed one chip shot field goal, he decided to leave his offense on the field and go for a touchdown, but quarterback Buck Ballou was hit as he threw and the ball fell harmlessly to the ground. Through two quarters, the defenses had stolen the headlines. Neither offense had run for more than 50 yards, and both teams had gained more yards passing than rushing. But when the second half began, Walker would ignite the home crowd, and put South Carolina on its heels. The University of North Carolina's 1980 football season had been all about gaining respect for their overlooked team and their overlooked league. The Tar Heels had won eight games in 1979 and finished in the top 15. Now, in 1980, led by linebacker Lawrence Taylor and running back Amos Lawrence, UNC was undefeated and ranked seventh with a merciless defense. The Heels had allowed the fewest points in the country, and their starters were yet to even allow a single touchdown through their first seven games. Yet, for its matchup with the twice-beaten Oklahoma Sooners in Norman, North Carolina was installed as a six-point underdog. Sooners head coach Barry Switzer probably didn't help the Tar Heels' paranoia when he greeted UNC's Coach Crum when the visitors arrived on the Friday before the game. Switzer met him on the practice field and said, Denny, I really look forward to playing your great team. They spoke for about 10 minutes, and it was Denny this and Denny that. Coach Crum didn't say a word, just stared blankly at Switzer. That's because his name wasn't Denny. Denny Crum was the basketball coach at Louisville. 
Dick Crum was the football coach at UNC, and an extra motivated one now that his opponent couldn't bother to even get his name right. On Saturday, as the teams warmed up before the game, a gang of Tar Heel players started walking down the ramp towards where some Sooners were getting loose. Led by Lawrence Taylor, they taunted and mocked the home team and Coach Switzer. Now it was the Sooners who had the extra motivation. UNC may have had a sterling defense, but Oklahoma's wishbone, masterfully led by quarterback Julius Caesar Watts, feared nobody. Known by his initials, J.C., the senior quarterback was a gifted passer, but rarely got to show those talents as the Sooners rolled over teams with nearly 400 yards rushing per game. They had put together back-to-back wins since dropping a game to Texas in which Watts had committed an eye-popping seven turnovers. The first Saturday in November would pit strength versus strength, as the irresistible force of the Sooners' rushing attack would meet the immovable object of the UNC defense. On the second play of the game, Amos Lawrence broke free and bolted 72 yards before being caught from behind. The next play was an Oklahoma interception, but the UNC defense would force a turnover of its own to keep the Sooners off the scoreboard. Later in the quarter, the Sooners drew first blood on a fourth down option play that made the score 7-0. The Tar Heels would answer to tie the game, but entered halftime trailing 14-7. The third quarter opened with a line drive kickoff that was inadvertently carried backwards into the end zone by the Sooners' returner. The referees accidentally blew their whistles, and so, instead of the play resulting in a safety for UNC, Oklahoma kept the ball. 97 yards later, the Sooners were in the end zone again, and a nightmarish 15 minutes for the Tar Heels was just beginning. Uh, The game itself was very even for the first half. You look at the final score, and you forget that, but it was a very even game in the first half. It was 14-7 Sooners, and actually it should have been 14-14. Rod Elkins had an open receiver in the end zone, a guy named Mike Chatham, who had been an all-ACC tight end. Um, Mike had a stun ball. It's a touchdown pass if he holds on to it, but he lost the ball in the sun and didn't hold it. If he does, it's 14-14. Instead, it's 14-7, but Carolina's still feeling pretty good. Um, they've never played anybody like Oklahoma at Oklahoma um, in, in this area. You know, they played a great Pittsburgh team at home, but they, you know, playing at Oklahoma was something that, that was unique. Anyway, feeling good about the start of the second half. They have Oklahoma backed up to start the second half. It is third and nine on the Oklahoma five. And the heels are thinking, you know, we're going to get a stop. We're going to get the ball. We're going to get good field position. We're going to go down and tie this game. Weldon Ledbetter, out of the wishbone, rumbles. 53 yards for a first down, and the route was on. I mean, that play changed the game. Carolina could not get a stop, could not get off the field after that play. I'll never forget it. It was one of the most dramatic plays in in my time of watching UNC football. UNC would run just seven offensive plays in the third quarter, turning it over once and allowing 20 points to Oklahoma. The Sooners' backups would tack on another touchdown to make the final tally 41-7. to They're counting it down. It is all over. J.C. Watts, three touchdowns. The Oklahoma offense that went for nearly 500 yards. We'll have to wait for the official statistics, but well over 450, whereas North Carolina had only allowed 76 per ball game and two yards per carry. But it was a different, different story, Bud Wilkinson. For the Tar Heels, Oklahoma's domination was as shocking as it was complete. In just one game, UNC had allowed more points than it had given up in the entire season to that point. It was a thorough demolition of the previously unbeaten Tar Heels who came to Norman to earn respect and left wondering what to make of the shattered pieces of their dream season. The win gave Oklahoma momentum as it hunted its seventh straight conference championship and eliminated one of just six teams that began the day with a perfect record. The fourth-ranked Georgia Bulldogs were another team hoping to escape with its unblemished record intact, but led number 14 South Carolina just 3-0 at halftime of their game. The pregame hype surrounded running backs George Rogers and Herschel Walker, but in the first half, neither superstar could find much room to run. That would change on the Bulldogs' third play of the third quarter. Facing a third down and six from its own 24-yard line, the call came down from the press box for Georgia to run play 22. 
the lead draw. The play had been installed early in the season, but had consistently failed to gain results. After weeks of self-scouting and tinkering, the coaches felt that the time might be right to spring the deceptive-looking play on the Gamecocks. Buck Ballou turned to give the ball to Walker, who exploded through the line of scrimmage and screamed down the far sideline. Three different South Carolina defenders looked to have an angle on him, but Walker turned on his sprinter speed and outraced them all as if they were standing still. South Carolina in a 5-3, and they run a trap with Herschel Walker. Got a hole, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. There goes Herschel. There goes Herschel. <laughs> Suddenly, 76 yards, Herschel Walker scores, hole at the right tackle. Man, did he turn it on when he had to. Suddenly, 9 to nothing in a dog's lead, and the stadium trembles and cracks a little bit. And I broke off the, uh, the right side, and I remember going up the sideline, there was a guy that had an angle on me, and... Uh, I don't know, I, I, I can almost bet a lot of people thought that he was going to make the tackle. But I remember thinking to myself, you know, I can run a little bit. You know, I can get this here. And I remember as his angle got close and close, I knew I had him. I knew he didn't have the speed to uh, cut me off. Georgia now led 10 to nothing, And after Rex Robinson made his second field goal of the game from more than 50 yards away, the advantage grew to 13 to nothing. But South Carolina responded with a field goal of its own. And then, its fullback rumbled 39 yards for a touchdown to draw the Gamecocks to within three points at 13-10. All afternoon, South Carolina had bludgeoned Georgia's defense with run after run. And now that sledgehammer attack was starting to pay dividends. Rodgers could sense that the tired Bulldogs defense was ripe for the picking when he and the Gamecocks offense took the field in Georgia territory with seven minutes to go. There would be no misdirection or surprises on this possession, Everybody watching the game knew exactly what was coming, and Georgia's defense looked powerless to stop the relentless pounding of the South Carolina veteran offensive line and Rodgers, who was showing why some described him as animated concrete. Rodgers for nine yards to the Georgia 38. Rodgers for three yards and a first down. Rodgers for eight yards to the Georgia 27. Rodgers for seven yards to the Georgia 20 and another first down. But after the whistle, Rodgers lay rolling on the turf in pain. He'd been playing for some weeks with broken bones in his right hand, and as he struggled to his feet, he started jogging towards the Carolina sideline, favoring his right arm. Coach Dan Carlin called a timeout to give Rodgers more time to recover. He remained on the sidelines for the next play, but then Rodgers trotted back into the huddle after missing just one snap. It was no mystery who was getting the ball on this play. Second down, long seven at the Georgia 17. Rodgers. Fumble. Loose on the ground. Georgia's got it. First turnover. George Rodgers had gone out with his arm hurt. He comes back. Can't hold the ball as the Bulldogs knock it loose and recover the ball. Tim Parks. Rodgers' sore right hand surely affected his grip on the football, but it was a perfectly timed punch by the All-American Scott Werner that knocked it free. I got run over by uh, the son of from South Carolina. What's his name? George Rodgers. Yeah, three times. <laughs> freight train. I mean, freight train. You hear me? I mean, he stepped on me one time going by. And the, and the last time, that's why, I, the last time when I caused the fumble in the in the in the on the drive at the end of the game. Uh, I went by him like a flash. I'd already been run over twice. I wasn't getting run over at the entire time. They weren't anyway. I mean, he absolutely, I mean, I, I probably I probably lost brain cells twice because of George Ryder. Yeah, and Buck said, said he asked, Buck asked me, he said, man, I, I still can't believe you, 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 you went by him so damn fast. And I said, yeah, but, I'd already been run over three, two times before that. I'm going to get run over a third time. There's no way. That was the most monumental fumble, I think, in Carolina history. 
I still have dreams about that play, <laughs> uh, honestly, because um, I was I watched I, it was a 48 pitch, so I was the lead guard, and George had gotten out. The defensive end crashed our tight end, I'm pretty sure, and had impeded me from getting around to get to the linebacker, and he had already he was already in my peripheral vision, which he never was. I was you know I would always leave. And next thing I know, I see the ball is in the air, and I, I, I was just, I was just not close enough. You know, I was like four yards, five yards away, maybe, maybe not that much, but too far to grab it. And uh, I remember when we started that drive, we all got together, and uh, I, I'm not sure what you call our huddle, uh, a choral, as in chorus, huddle where all the guys, we didn't huddle in a circle. We, we huddled facing uh, two lines, uh, facing the line of scrimmage. So I was uh, in the front. The, the right guard was in the front of the right line of guys, and the center was in the front of the left line of guys. And then Gary, the quarterback, would come into the middle, and he would normally put his, his hands on my belly, and, and Mark Austin's belly, the center, and lean in and talk to us that way. And I remember uh, Schechterly, George Schechterly was my right tackle. We were leaning, I was leaning back on him, and he was leaning forward on me because <laughs> we were so dehydrated. We were so tired. You know, that game was just a physical battle. And uh, we said, okay, you know, they can't stop us. They haven't stopped us all day. Let's go. And we knew that we had to score. And we knew we were going to win. We knew it. And, and, and we drove the ball down the field. I can't recall where we started. I think it was like our 17 or, I mean, it was, it was a hell of a drive. And we would make it. Then we would barely make it. Then we'd make it. We'd barely make it. And then there we were uh, with George Hurt. And we thought, well, that doesn't matter. You know, we're going we're gonna to make the holes. We're going to make the – we're gonna, it's going to be open. Whoever gets the ball is going to be able to make it. And, you know, of course we were like, shit, you know, we hate to see him hurt, but we knew somebody would step up like Carl did. You know, we had other guys that could play. And uh, when George came back in, um, I never gave it a second thought that he was, you know, too injured to to hold the ball. And he obviously he was. And uh, in the end, hindsight, whatever that's worth. But, um I just remember feeling just crushed, you know, when we lost the ball because the Georgia kids were gassed and we were gassed as well, but we seemed to be uh, winning that battle. You know, they were tired, we were tired, but we weren't that tired, you know, and Eddie Weaver, I believe was the kid playing in front of me and um, he was just, he was puking. You know, I remember him lining up, and they, they lined up in a, a low four-point stance, and just everybody was puking because everybody was just just uh, miserable. It was so hot, you know, and the adrenaline was pumping, and we knew we had to score, but that was it. You know, the fumble ended it. It was, it was terrible. It was terrible. Georgia took over deep in its own territory, and three runs by Walker failed to gain a first down. The Bulldogs sent their punter on with less than four minutes to go and it appeared that Rodgers would have a chance at redemption. But it was not to be. A South Carolina defender attempting to block the kick crashed into the punter, and the ensuing penalty gave the Bulldogs a fresh set of downs. Walker helped bleed the clock, and the Gamecocks regained possession at their own one-yard line, with just 45 seconds left and one timeout. A desperation pass was intercepted, and Georgia had held on to win 13-10. In the battle between Walker and Rodgers, both backs had excelled, but it was the freshman that had the bigger day. Herschel finished with 43 carries for 219 yards and a touchdown, while Rodgers gained 168 before fumbling on his 35th and final carry of the day. It was Rodgers' 18th straight game with more than 100 yards, and in the losing effort, he surpassed another milestone as he became just the 11th player to ever rush for more than 4,000 yards in a career. Afterwards, Rodgers and Coach Carlin took turns answering questions and taking their share of the blame for the fumble. 
Some wondered if the mishap on such a national stage would cost Rodgers the Heisman. He had three games left to impress the voters, and if the Gamecocks could win all three, they'd be the first team in school history to capture nine games in a single season. Georgia was battered and bruised, but still unbeaten. Buck Ballou, Herschel Walker, and a laundry list of defenders that dared step in front of Rodgers would spend significant time at the trainer's table to treat their injuries in the week ahead. But the Bulldogs would have to heal quickly. In just seven days, they would meet the Florida Gators in Jacksonville in the first of three straight rivalry games to end the season. The once-beaten Gators were one of two teams challenging Georgia for the SEC crown. The other, number one ranked Alabama, was clinging to a three-point lead against Mississippi State as the second half began in Jackson. Alabama senior quarterback Don Jacobs was the third different starting quarterback in three years in Tuscaloosa. He had been on the sidelines to see his predecessor Jeff Rutledge and Stedman Sheely lead the tide to back-to-back national titles. Now, it was Jacobs who was helming Coach Bear Bryant's crusade for a third straight crown and leading the nation's top-scoring offense. In 30 minutes against Mississippi State, he had been frustrated by an inspired defense that gave no quarter and punished ball carriers with every snap. Alabama had managed just three points on a last-second field goal after a Bulldogs fumble just before halftime. Now, halfway through the third quarter and still ahead 3 nothing. Jacobs was on the sidelines after taking yet another brutal hit from the Mississippi State defense. His backup, Alan Gray, was in the game, but found the Bulldogs to be no less hostile. He was hit and fumbled, and Mississippi State converted the turnover into a field goal to tie the game. The tense struggle continued, both offenses running their wishbone triple option attacks, and both defenses reluctant to give a single inch. In the fourth quarter, with 12 minutes to play, The Bulldogs drove 67 yards, and kicker Dana Moore connected on a 22-yard field goal to put his team ahead 6-3. It was the first time Alabama had trailed in the second half all year. The Tide tried to answer, but its drive stalled at the Bulldogs' 47-yard line, where it faced a fourth and three. Coach Bryant called a timeout, sensing it was a critical moment in the game but received some unsolicited advice from the Mississippi State defenders. Well, I remember it very well because they called timeout to decide what to do. And Cook, Johnny Cook, and I think Larry Friday, the safety, uh, it sounds like something that they would do, uh, went, went within 15, 20 yards of the Alabama bench and were yelling at Coach Bryant, uh, you got to go for this. You've got to go for this. You're Bear Bryant. You're Alabama. You've got to go for this. Whether he was goaded into it or not, Bryant elected to leave his offense on the field. Jacobs took the snap and was dragged down behind the line of scrimmage to end the threat. The Bulldogs took over. It tried to run out the clock, but with two minutes left, Coach Ballard sent his kicker out to extend the lead with a 48-yard attempt. Alabama's Mike Pitts broke through the middle of the line and blocked the kick. Alabama had life once again. On first down, Jacobs was thrown for a three-yard loss, and he slipped and fell while trying to throw on second down. It was third down and 20, and the Mississippi State fans were in delirium. Before he could snap the ball, Jacobs was flagged for a delay of game penalty, but Bear Bryant was able to appeal to the official and have the flag picked up because the crowd noise was overwhelming. With no timeouts and a dwindling clock, the nation's longest winning streak was on life support. Alabama was desperate. It broke the wishbone and shifted into an eye formation. It would put the game on the right arm of Jacobs, who had completed just one of his first nine passes. On third and long, he connected with Major Ogilvy down the sidelines for 25 yards and a first down. Another clutch pass to Jesse Bendross moved the ball inside the Bulldogs' 20-yard line. The mostly partisan crowd was screaming in full throat and clanging their cowbells, trying to will their defense to somehow stop the tide. A third straight completion. This one to tight end Bart Kraut set Alabama up with a first down at the Mississippi State four-yard line. The clock was momentarily stopped as the teams scrambled to the line of scrimmage while the yard markers were set. This time, Alabama lined up in the wishbone. Jacobs crouched under center, but the noise in the stadium was so deafening, he turned to the referee and pointed to the side of his helmet to signal that he couldn't hear. Under the rules of college football at the time, if a quarterback thought it was too loud to communicate, he could appeal to the referee. If the official agreed, he could stop the game to allow the crowd to settle. The clock was now running under 10 seconds, 
and the referee refused to give Alabama a reprieve. Here's what that play sounded like to fans watching on television on November 1st, 1980. Alabama gets on the goal line with 22 seconds. Wishbone offense. No timeout for Alabama. Jacobs says he cannot hear. Jacobs goes up underneath. Jacobs long snap count. Goes to the fullback. Fumble! Fumbles the ball. Bulldogs recover. Bulldogs recover. Bulldogs recover. With six seconds, the Bulldogs recover. Yeah, guy, which I don't really know who came through and made the hit. Of course, we're going to get a, fifth, a, a, a penalty for delay of the game with all these players. I could care less right now. But somebody just made a tremendous hit from the left side. And again, Billy Jackson right there on the spot. I tell you, you just, you just can't say enough about this Bulldog defense. Jacobs took the snap and moved down the line to his right, where he was smashed by defensive end Tyrone Keyes. The ball came loose and Mississippi State's Billy Jackson recovered at the four-yard line with just six seconds left in the game. Freshman quarterback John Bond was in disbelief as he huddled with his teammates and called for a victory formation to seal the win against Alabama. But the final play was anything but ceremonial. Backed up to their own goal line by a celebration penalty, the Bulldogs had no room for error. As the ball was snapped to Bond, it popped up in the air and a scrum ensued. If Alabama recovered, it could steal the game. Bond remembers the chaos in those final seconds. The linebacker starts walking up, and he's hovering over the ball. And I'm kind of talking to Kent. I'm t- you know, I'm, what's this guy doing? What's this guy doing? And uh, I didn't get a response, and I call a snap count, of course, and that's when he slaps the ball, and it flies right by me, and I, I, never, even, I never even touched the snap. And everybody said, man, you fumbled it later. I said, I never even touched it. The guy slapped it, and it flies right by me. So it was uh, it was nuts there at the end. It was nuts there at the end, and uh, um, and I'm hollering, "Who's got the ball, Kent? Who's got the ball? Who's got the ball?" And Kent goes, "I don't know, I don't know." I'm hollering, "Who's got the ball?" And I heard I heard Donald Ray. He had kind of a Mike Tyson voice, and he says, "I got you, JB. I got you." <laughs> that is fantastic. We won this thing. Let's get out of here. Let's go hug some cheerleaders. The loss ended Alabama's winning streaks of 28 games overall. 26 in the SEC, and 22 over Mississippi State. The Bulldogs carried Ballard off the field on their shoulders, and the party continued into the home team's locker room where Queen's Another One Bites the Dust blared from the speakers. As the team was celebrating the biggest win in school history, the fervor started to die down, and a hush rippled through the room as the players stopped and looked towards the door. You know, we're going nuts in the back, and and I'm right, I'm in a corner. I got two lockers right there in the corner. And then my left side of my line was down my left, and my right side was down my right. And, uh, and I hear this kind of a hush, kind of start from the front, and work his way to the back. And I'm like, what? what's going on? So we all stand up and we look. And an Alabama Highway Patrolman had his hand up, and he pulled out a folding chair. And Coach Bryant climbed up in the folding chair. And said a couple of things I couldn't really hear, and then it got really, really quiet when he started talking. And I mean, you could hear a pin drop then. And uh, the last thing he said was, "Fellas, don't let any of these guys out here writing about this fool you. Y'all whooped us today. Congratulations." And he got down and walked out the double door, double metal door. And we all went nuts again. <laughs> when reporters left the room to head back up to the press box and write their stories, they couldn't believe what they saw. Nearly 20,000 fans were still in the stands celebrating. The jubilation spread from Jackson to Starkville that night and beyond. Coach Ballard had promised his team two days off if they could pull off the upset, and quarterback John Bond drove his car to Athens, Georgia to spend the long weekend with his girlfriend and high school friends Buck Ballou and Herschel Walker. The Bulldogs had a week off to enjoy the victory, then closed out the year with wins over LSU and Ole Miss to earn a berth in the Sun Bowl. They finished 5-1 and one in the SEC, with the only loss being to Florida. That Gators victory would later be vacated when it was discovered that they were spying on Mississippi State practices. Coach Ballard would lead Mississippi State to another bowl game in 1981, but finished his coaching career with four straight losing seasons in Starkville before retiring after the 1985 campaign. That weekend in Jackson would mark the final time a Bear Bryant coach team would be ranked number one. The normally potent tied running game was limited to just 116 yards. Legend has it 
that when the team bus pulled back into Tuscaloosa, Bear had it take the team right to the practice field for some extra work. The Crimson Tide could climb back in the title chase when it played unbeaten Notre Dame in two weeks in Birmingham, but for the first time since the opening week of the season, there would be a new number one. UCLA, along with half of the Pac-10 conference, was on probation for academic violations. The Bruins couldn't play in a bowl game, but they could, and had, beaten every team on their schedule to climb up to number two in the polls. While Alabama was floundering against Mississippi State, UCLA was building a 17-14 first-half lead on the road against Arizona and its backup quarterback. Bruins coach Terry Donahue told his team at halftime that Alabama had been upset and that if his team could maintain its lead in the second half, UCLA would be the number one team in the country. The first half was marred by missed opportunities for the Bruins. After an opening touchdown, UCLA threw just its second interception of the season and followed that up with a Freeman-McNeil fumble. Leading 14-7, UCLA appeared to take a 21-7 lead, but a second referee overturned the back judge's call of touchdown, and the Bruins settled for a field goal instead. Replay later showed that the play should have been called a touchdown on the field. Instead of blowing out the Wildcats, UCLA's mistake-prone first half provided just a slim three-point lead. The third quarter began with a three-play, 80-yard drive by Arizona that put it ahead 21-17. UCLA would not score again, and its quarterback, Tom Ramsey, was sacked five times in the second half, including a fourth-quarter safety, to make the final score 23-17. And I just remember we had found out at halftime that Alabama had just lost. So we were like, hey, we win this game, we go to number one. So, you know, there's no way we're going to lose this game. And what happens, we end up losing the damn game. And I just remember her. A lot of our players used to carry boom boxes at that time. And uh, I just remember one of the guys, I can't remember who it was, obviously had Heartbreak Hotel playing on the on the bus ride to the airport. And, boy, it was so fitting. We were just like, we could not believe that we had lost a game that we could have easily won. The top two teams in the poll had been upset, as had undefeated and sixth-ranked UNC, and unbeaten number 11 Baylor, who was stunned at home by San Jose State. It was the sixth straight week that a top-five team had fallen victim to an upset, and only two teams with perfect records remain, Notre Dame and Georgia. When the polls were released on Sunday, they would occupy the top two spots. The chaos of the 1980 season was not over yet, as the next five weekends would also see at least one top-five team go down each week. But with bowl bids about to be announced, which teams could survive with a chance to claim the title? And would any undefeated teams be left standing on New Year's Day? Next week on Hidden Yardage, the story of the 1980 college football season. College football's new number one, Notre Dame, invades Atlanta, looking to continue head coach Dan Devine's storybook final season against an outmatched Georgia Tech squad. But would the Irish be caught looking ahead to their clash with the Crimson Tide? One week after surviving South Carolina, Georgia squares off with Florida in the annual cocktail party game in Jacksonville and provides one of college football's most memorable finishes ever. And the incredibly true story of quarterback Dave Wilson's battle with the NCAA in his record-setting day against Ohio State in the horseshoe. The Hidden Yardage podcast is researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Joe Moore. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts. For a list of everybody that appeared in this episode and special acknowledgments, visit the website at www.hiddenyardagepodcast.com. There you'll find a full transcript of every show, as well as schedules, stats, and standings from the 1980 season. Please email your questions and comments to me at joe at hiddenyardagepodcast.com. This podcast is made possible through Moonlight Magic Productions. Thank you for listening.